هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد ما دير بدرز السستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last week when we were doing Surah Al-Adiyat, there were a couple of verses that I missed out and I wanted to go back to those verses بإذن الله تعالى. The first verse that we missed out last week was in, وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٍ That indeed he bears witness to his deeds. Now over here, the question of the pronoun, that the, the إِنَّهُ Who does it refer back to? Does it refer back to mankind or does it refer back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So you'll find that in the books of Tafsir, the scholars differed. That one group said that it refers back to mankind, another group said that it refers back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in such a situation, there's no problem in combining between the two opinions. Meaning that when it refers to the deeds on the Day of Judgment, not only will mankind testify against himself, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will testify to his deeds as well. Because on that day, as we mentioned last week, that mankind will not be able to escape what his hands and limbs will say. And you'll see that there's even more to it than just the hands and the limbs today when when we discuss Surah Al-Zalzala. Then the verse after that, وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ That indeed he is very aggressive in his desire for money and for wealth. Now you'll notice that the term that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for wealth over here is not the typical mal. He did, usually when he talks about wealth, he uses the term mal. But over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't use the term mal, he uses the word khair. Now khair generally speaking, you would assume that it means goodness or it means righteousness or any act that you know may be considered noble. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he refers to khair over here, it is referring to wealth. And the proof for that is from Surah Al-Baqarah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about leaving a will behind, he says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَوْتِ إِنْ تَرَكَ خَيْرًا الْوَصِيَةِ That here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that when death becomes, you know, apparent to any of you, or starts to approach you, then it becomes compulsory at that time, إِنْ تَرَكَ خَيْرًا الْوَصِيَةِ That He leaves a great wasiyah behind, meaning that He leaves a wasiyah that is plentiful. Now wasiyah, what we mean by that, is an individual writes down a document that consists of his debts, you know, people that he wants to give wealth to, that are already not naturally inheriting from him, and then likewise his burial process, and any advice that he would like to give to his family. That is what wasiyah is referring to. So those two verses were missed last week, and I wanted to cover them right now. Now let us start off with the surah that we're going to cover today, bithillahi ta'ala, which is Surah Al-Zalzala. Surah Al-Zalzala. And the zalzala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to in the surah is the earthquake that is going to happen on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And it's such a massive earthquake that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about it at the very beginning of Surah Al-Hajj. At the very beginning of Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, and fear your Lord and know that the, the zalzala of the hereafter, or the beginning of the day of judgment is indeed a great matter. Now an interesting thing to look at over here is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses the zalzala and in understanding the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, as you'll notice in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything has a general logical flow. Meaning that the sun will rise day and night and it doesn't stop. The, no, the moon will come at the same time. The tides will come and go at the same time. The seasons generally will come and go at the same time. This is the logical flow that I'm referring to. So now, as we mentioned previously, on the Day of Judgment, all the bodies that are inside of the earth, they're going to need to come out. So while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have just told the dead bodies to come out of the grave, the logical progression that takes place at that time is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes a massive earthquake, and that is what expels the bodies from the ground. So whether you died in the ocean, whether you were buried, whether you were eaten alive, whatever the case may have been, everyone at that time will be extracted from the ground due to this great earthquake that will take place. 
Now the point over here, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this is because if you look at the significance of an earthquake, how many people have actually you know, witnessed an earthquake themselves? Can I see a raise of hands? When was the last time Calgary had an earthquake? Does anyone remember? 98? Okay, mashallah. I tried looking it up, I couldn't find anything. It was mentioned like 70s and stuff, and I'm sure there must have been something after that. So we have a 98 over here. Inshallah khair. The issue of the earthquake, you know, as a human being, we require certainty in almost all of our affairs. Meaning that when we go home, we expect our homes to be there and our furniture and, and, and the families to be there. Same thing when we go to work, we expect to have a job. So generally speaking, I would say about 95% of our lives are actually built upon certainty. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, He mentions the zalzala because the zalzala is one of those things that takes certainty away. Because one of the things that you're certain to, that we're certain to as a human being, that when I walk, I'll be able to keep myself balanced. When I walk, I'll be able to control where I'm going. But in reality, on the Day of Judgment, when it began, begins, it is the exact opposite. That now when this earthquake happens, it's such a massive earthquake, that people are so overwhelmed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as being drunk. Now I'm sure you may have seen you know, a drunk individual. SubhanAllah, I remember this is about two weeks ago, on my way home on Deerfoot, getting off the Beddington exit, they actually had you know, a, an alcohol test. And you know, I've always hoped that I'd get pulled over to do an alcohol test, just that to say, you know, I haven't been drinking, let me go. But I've never been pulled over yet. So even this time, you know, I'm, I'm stuck behind the cars, we're not going anywhere. And as we're stuck there, there's an individual to my right hand side. I mean, SubhanAllah, you would think that by now, you know, after so many years of campaigns, people would realize it's not safe to drink and drive. This individual, he got out of his car, they gave him the breathalyzer test. You know, he's out of his mind, he has no idea what's going on. They're like, can you please walk on a straight line? And literally, you know, not even for three steps could he walk in a straight line. He put one step, two steps, and the third step he like started to, to tumble over to his side. And this is like, you know, a reminder of that is what the Day of Judgment is going to be like. That you have such a severe shaking of the earth, that you try to take a couple of steps and try to keep your balance, it's not going to happen. And that is why one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people as being drunk. Number two, the second reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people as being drunk is their state of mind. So you'll notice that when a person is intoxicated, what happens to his speech? His speech starts to slur and it doesn't make sense. You know, they'll go from one thought to the next thought and it's not coherent at all. And that's what's going to happen that on the Day of Judgment as well. That people's speech, they're going to be so overwhelmed that it starts to slur and their speech will not be coherent. Their speech will not be coherent. So this is the zalzada that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the surah. And he says, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا That when the earth is shaken with its final earthquake. Now you'll notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He starts off this surah by saying when. Meaning that this is a warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that it's definitely going to happen and you have to prepare for that day. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say if or He doesn't say that it happened in the past. But this is a warning for the future. And you'll notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives these clear signs so that mankind will take heed. So the whole Qur'an within of itself is a warning for mankind. And that is why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when He described the Day of Judgment, he said that myself and the Day of Judgment came like this. Meaning that there's not much time between myself and the Day of Judgment coming. Now the scholars differed, what exactly did the Messenger of Allah وسلم, mean? What they clearly understood is that the, one of the major signs of the Day of Judgment was the coming of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, himself. So that was like the greatest sign that the Day of Judgment was now coming near. And that was like one of the major signs that the Day of Judgment is now coming near. But the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went like this. And now we notice that, look, we're still alive 1400 years later. So how do you make sense of this hadith? Who can answer this? How do you make sense of the hadith? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we came like this, and we're still alive 1400 years later. Go ahead. I think that the, the human history, or the, the, the history of the earth is that long. Like 1400 years is... Like this means if you go back, it can be millions and billions. Ahsant, excellent. That the closeness that the Messenger of Allah is speaking to is relative to the existence of the earth itself. Now the earth, as we know, scientifically proven, has been you know, around millions and millions of years. So 1400 years out of those millions of years, relatively speaking, it is nothing at all. 
It is nothing at all. And that is how that hadith is understood. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when talking about this zalzala, He talks about that the earth will throw out athqalaha. Now the term thiqal over here, it generally means to something that is heavy and burdensome. So when you're carrying a box and you want to say that you know this box is heavy, you would say that this box is thaqil and is burdensome. Now similarly, when the earth carries the body, it becomes burdensome as well. Now why is it burdensome upon the earth? Because the vast majority of individuals that will be swallowed by the earth and buried inside the earth, unfortunately, are not going to be righteous people. And the earth, it carries the burden of this responsibility. That a time will come where it will have to expel these individuals. And you'll come to see in the very next verse, that it's not only about expelling the bodies from the earth, but the earth now has the responsibility to testify against them. So the burden that is being referred to in this verse is not just the burden of weight. In reality, you'll notice that the body disintegrates and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rebuild it for the day of judgment. But the burden that the earth is speaking about is the burden of testimony. Meaning that on the day of judgment, when the earth has to testify, it's going to be a very burdensome act upon the earth itself. Now, verse number three, وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا the mankind will say on that day that you know what's wrong with the earth? Why is it continuously and perpetually shaking? So it is something that mankind will not even understand. And this shows you subhanAllah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows the state of the human beings at that time. That even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this forewarning that look, this day of judgment is going to come, one of the signs is going to be this great earthquake, even then, people would not have taken heed. That they're going to ask, you know, why is the earth shaking? They won't recognize even that the day of judgment is beginning at that time. They won't recognize even that the day of judgment is beginning at that time. And that is why they will ask, you know, what is with the earth that it keeps shaking perpetually. Now important thing to understand is, is the progression of events that will happen to begin the day of judgment. So the very first thing that happens when the day of judgment begins, is the blowing of the trumpet. So the angel, he will blow the trumpet the first time, and anyone that is alive at that time will actually die. And as we know, it is the worst of creation that will be alive just before the day of judgment. This is literally just before the day of judgment. After the killing of the Dajjal, after Isa alayhi salam going to the mountain and the believers passing away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves the worst of creation alive. And once the worst of creation are alive, a people that will not even you know, recognize the statement of La ilaha illallah, then an angel will come at that time, a trumpet will be blown, and it will be a deafening sound. Meaning it will be absolutely overwhelming that a person will be you know, knocked out completely. And that is the first step of the Day of Judgment. Now the scholars differed in terms of how many times will the trumpet be blown thereafter in order for resurrection to begin. And he differed, will it be two times? Will it be three times? The opinion of the majority is that it will only be blown two times. The first time is to knock everyone out, and then the second time is to commence the Day of Judgment and the events. So now, once the second trumpet is blown according to the opinion of the majority, that is when the earth starts to shake and starts to expel everyone that is in the ground. The earth will start to shake and it will start to expel everyone that is in the ground. And then when they're resurrected, they're such, in such a state of shock, in such a state of being overwhelmed, that they start to ask, you know, why is the earth shaking and what is happening? And we mentioned this last week and I'll repeat it again for the sake of benefit. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions that all of mankind, he will, they will be raised in a state, hufatan aratan, that in a state without any clothes on, and in a state that they originally came out in, meaning that they were uncircumcised. Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, won't that be embarrassing for the people? Meaning that won't people look at one another and won't people be you know, embarrassed and want to be you know, shy and cover themselves? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he responds by saying that the affair will be greater than that on that day. Meaning that the affair of the Day of Judgment, it's going to be so overwhelming that a person will not care about the nudity of another individual. He's going to be concerned about the events on that day. Meaning what is happening right now? And then number two is that he has to get ready to prepare himself to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has to get ready to prepare himself to, uh, to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
In verse number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْ حَالَهَا That that day, it will declare its information because its Lord inspired it. And this is what I was referring to. The last week we talked about on how even the hands and limbs will testify towards an individual. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us the land that we are on, it will testify to the deeds that we did. And this is the burden, burden that the land has. That the land recognizes who is the righteous individual and who is the evil individual. And it will be made to testify on that day. Now there are a couple of issues related to this. Number one is, you know, how does this work exactly? And is this something that we're encouraged to keep in mind when we do good deeds? And the answer to this is yes. That as an individual is doing good and bad deeds, he needs to keep this in mind. That even the earth will testify to the deeds that he does. And the, the basis for this is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the chapter of the Adhan. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gives an advice to every mu'adhin. He says that, O oh, mu'adhin, if you're able to raise your voice as much as possible, then raise your voice. For indeed on the day of judgment, even the trees and the rocks will testify to the call that you gave. Even the trees and the rocks will testify to the call that you gave. Meaning, that now obviously this is not referring to a time where you have microphones. There's no need to show that, you know, the, the, the microphone system ends up blowing up. How many of you know Sheikh Riyadh? Sheikh Riyadh or Zazi? A couple of you. He's an instructor with Al-Maghrib Institute. And mashallah, the Sheikh is very, very energetic. And you know, several times, not even just once, like several times, uh, I've been with him, and you know, he's been using the mic, he gets extremely energetic, he starts shouting, you know, tables start shaking, things start falling, he's jumping on tables. <laughs> People who know him, you know, they'll understand what I'm talking about. And you know, literally times, the mic is like blown out. So obviously we're not talking about that time where the mother is giving the adhan on the mic, he starts shouting and you know, the microphone system blows up. No, we're talking about a time when a person is out in public, he should try to raise his voice as much as possible in giving the adhan, as long as he's not you know, disturbing the people around him. So it doesn't mean that you know, tomorrow morning you wake up for Fajr, you're like, yeah, we're supposed to raise our voices for adhan, I'm gonna go in my backyard and say, Allahu Akbar. No, that's not what we're talking about. This is like in a, in a situation where, you know, maybe you're out in a public park, you're out in the forest, no one else is there, you're not bothering anyone, give the adhan loud, all of the trees that are there, all of the animals that are there, all the land that is there, it will testify for you. So this is something to keep in mind in terms of good deeds and bad deeds. That not only will you yourself testify against yourself on the Day of Judgment, but also the land that exists, it will testify from the trees and the rocks and the earth and all of it as well. Who has the phone? We can turn that off please, inshallah. It's in the back. <laughs> He's praying, inshallah. <laughs> Khair. Khair. Number two, in terms of um, you know, the earth testifying, in terms of the earth testifying, the issue arises that how will the earth testify? Is this something meaning that the earth will actually speak or is it just going to give a sign or what will actually happen? Now this goes back to understanding what is the origin in speech. The origin in speech, is it meant to be taken literally or is it meant to be taken metaphorically? Now when it comes to the Qur'an specifically, the Qur'an is meant to be taken on its appearance. The Qur'an is meant to be taken on its appearance. Now this is a balance between something being taken literally and something being taken metaphorically. What does that mean? When something is taken literally, it means that you take it for the letter itself. Meaning that you do exactly what it says. But when something is taken to the apparent, it means you look at the context of the verse along with the wording. Along with the wording. So you look at the context along with the wording. And in something which is metaphorical, it means that, you know what, you don't pay too much attention to the actual letter of the command, but you look at the context and perhaps you know other um, signs inside of the, the structure that would indicate that it's not taken literally, that it's not taken literally. So the essence in the Qur'an is that the Qur'an is meant to be understood by everyone. So these literal devices for you know symbolism and for using metaphors, they're not used as much because even the most intelligent of person is meant to understand it, as well as a person that is not as intelligent. So it's for all species of mankind. So that is why you'll notice that this is the general rule. This is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is in accordance to our own intellects. So now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it will speak because it has been revealed to it, 
to speak. Allah knows best, but the apparent meaning over here is that there, since there's no literary devices to indicate that it is meant to be metaphorical, then this means on the apparent that the ground itself will actually speak. That the ground itself will actually speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say in the next verse, يَوْمَئِذِنْ يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ أَشْتَاتًا لِيَرَوْا أَعْمَالَهُمْ That that day mankind will proceed in scattered groups that they may be, show, they may be shown their deeds. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that now people have been scattered, they've been resurrected, they've come out of the ground, and they actually start scattering into groups. Now, why do they scatter into groups? This is something very important to understand. That you'll notice that in this day and age, or not even in this day and age, as part of being human, we always flock to people that we have similarities with. So someone comes from a similar country with you, who comes from India, Pakistan, from you know, Nigeria, from Somalia, will generally tan- tend to hang around the people that you know, we have a common culture with, or have a common likings with, or common dislikings with. But on the Day of Judgment, it's not about these petty and trivial things, like you know, our ethnicities or our likes and dislikes. But on that day, when people get scattered into groups, it's about you know, what did you stand for and believe for. Meaning, did you stand for La ilaha illallah? Did you believe in La ilaha illallah? If you did, then you're going to be with those group of people. Did you rebel against La ilaha illallah? Did you not testify to La ilaha illallah? Then you'll be scattered into another group. Then you'll be scattered into another group. And that is when you'll see that subhanAllah, again this concept of foreseeing signs, it starts from this dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this you know, earthquake, because we can recognize what an earthquake looks like, and it is a sign that each time there is an earthquake, it is a reminder that something greater than this earthquake is going to happen in, in the hereafter. Now similarly, this concept of uniting and becoming groups, it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows to happen in this dunya as well. So the people that we hang around with, we become small groups. Now these small groups are a reminder for the people of intellect and the people who reflect that the small groups that you see right now, they're a further sign that on the Day of Judgment, people will break down into groups as well. But on that day, it will be a separation between truth and falsehood. And this shows you the power of reflection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He talks about these very signs. And our whole life is filled with these signs that are there to remind us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Day of Judgment. So the very fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you know, birds of a feather to flock together is a very sign that is indicative of that fact that it's going to happen on the Day of Judgment, but on a greater proportion. That's not just about commonalities anymore, it's about where did you stand uh, in terms of the statement of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, because that will be the deciding factor. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to say, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ so he goes on to say, so whoever does good equal to the weight of an atom or a small ant shall see it. So now, last week we talked about how tafsir, it will vary based upon where the Qur'an was revealed. So when we were talking about al-adiyat, they were those animals that race forward. The scholars that said that the adiyat is a Makkan surah and refers to the people of Mecca, they said that, you know what? This is referring to the camels. Because it can't be the horses because the concept of fighting hadn't been revealed at that time. So it was referring to the, the camels that used to take the people for Hajj. But then those people that said, you know what? No, this is referring to something from Medina. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is referring to the horses. And at that time, the concept of fighting had already been introduced. Now similarly over here, we, refer, we get into a new concept. Is that can one use scientific progression to interpret the Qur'an. Can one use scientific progression to interpret the Qur'an? And this is why you'll see that when you read the Noble Qur'an, when you read the translation, it will say the weight of an ant or a small ant. So traditionally speaking, the scholars of tafsir, they said that the term dharra, it means a small ant. And those are like the tiny little baby ants, the times you know when you've gone for a picnic and they like scatter around you, those tiny little ants. That's what dharra is referring to, and that is what the majority of the scholars of tafsir mentioned. Why did they mention this? For two reasons. Reason number one is that this was the smallest thing that was known at the time of revelation. Meaning the concept of knowing an atom within of itself was not known. The concept of knowing an atom was not known within of itself. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would use an example that the people could relate to and the people could comprehend. So the dharra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to over here, they said is referring to the small ant. Now as time uh, progresses, human beings recognize that there are things that are smaller than the ant. And then they went on to translate, to, to look, interpret this, that what is the point over here? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to signify, you know, a, a virtue of the ant? Or is the concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about, that the smallest and most minute thing that comes to mind? And that is why you see that the scholars of, of tafsir, they'll take a, an approach again, that, you know, is the Quran meant to be taken literally in terms of its interpretation? Or can we have some sort of progression? So those scholars of tafsir that said, you know what, we allow some sort of progression, as long as the general meaning is retained, they went on to update their interpretation of the Qur'an, and they no longer used small ant, but rather, you know, mankind had now discovered this atom, and we've gone into, you know, further discoveries, so to make it even, even smaller than the atom itself. But they updated their translation of the Qur'an, Qur'an to say, that whoever even does an atom's weight of good or bad shall see it, on that day. So now the question arises, you know, what are guidelines that one needs to keep in mind in terms of this progression and what is allowed? Everyone agrees upon is that the meaning that you derive should not contradict the meaning of our predecessors. So all of the predecessors, they agreed that the lesson that we're trying to derive from this verse is that even the smallest and most minute things will be taken into account, whether they be good or bad. So that is the lesson that we're trying to derive. And then what you use as an example to derive that lesson is almost irrelevant. Not completely irrelevant, but almost irrelevant. Because the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to explain to us, that the smallest thing that you can think of, good or bad, a person will be held accountable for it on that day, and a person shall indeed see it. Now you'll notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He repeats the same sentence structure twice. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَهُ So the only word that changes is, uh, the, you know, the good and bad over here. Now this brings us to a discussion that we've had in the past, which is the concept of, you know, seeing your deeds and the concept of what will be weight. Previously we introduced two opinions. That when we talk about the scales on the Day of Judgment, we talked about two things that could possibly be weight. We said opinion number one is that it is the deeds themselves. Opinion number two, we said that no, it's not the deeds that are going to be weight, but rather it is scrolls that are going to be brought forth, and it's the scrolls that will be weight. And then opinion number three is that you know what, it's not the deeds nor is it the scrolls, but in fact it's the individual themselves. Now let us look at proofs for all of these opinions. Opinion number one, we said that it is the deeds that will be weighed. And it is the deeds that will actually be seen. And the verses that we see in this verse, they actually promote this opinion. And in fact, you would see that the vast majority of the Qur'an and the vast majority of the Sunnah actually promote this opinion. You look at the very, very last hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He talks about two words that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are light upon the tongue, yet they are heavy upon the scales. Who knows what those two words are? Exactly, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al azim. That these two statements, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam describes them as saying that they are light on the tongue, beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and heavy on the scales. Now heavy on the scales meaning that it is these deeds that will actually have some weight. It is these deeds that will actually have some weight. Opinion number two, we said it is actually the scrolls that will be brought forth. Who remembers the proof for that? What is the proof that it is the scrolls that will be weighed? Go ahead. There was a hadith of the individual uh, who did many things and then <coughs> when the scrolls were put, right, so they get the point. I get the point, but continue. <laughs> Summarize it to the best of your ability. Uh, yeah. The man who commits so many sins tonight man's full breath of sins. Yeah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts his one kirim of shahada which outweighs it. Do you remember what this hadith is called in Arabic? <laughs> Ahsant. So the hadith of the bitaqa found in Sahih al-Bukhari, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa talks about a man that has committed so many sins that they are written down on scrolls and there are 99 of them. And each scroll 
as as long as you know as far as the eye can see another narration as far as the distance between the east and the west now this individual thinks that he's destroyed that he's destined for the hellfire but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the angels and the angels bring him his good deeds what does he have this one card it's not a scroll it's just a card it's a bataqa and on this card is written the statement of la ilaha illallah they on this card is written that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that this individual lived with tawheed. And now you would think that 99 scrolls against one bitaqa, the logical thing to understand is that you know the scrolls would outweigh the bitaqa. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the weight of tawheed. He shows you know, the strength of this concept of monotheism in Islam, the very basis of our faith and religion, that this is what will end up saving that man. So even though he may have committed sins, he never committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to negate his monotheism. And as long as he didn't do that, then the small sins that he committed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pardon him. And this, clear, this hadith is very explicit about scrolls and the card. There's no mention of weight of the actual deeds themselves. And then the third opinion, where it is the individual themselves that will be weight. And this is based upon the hadith in Sahih Bukhari as well, where one day, it was a very windy day, and Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was by a tree. And when he was by this tree, or he was climbing this tree, his izar moved to the side, and his shins and his legs became you know, apparent to the people. And they were very, very thin. So the people of Quraysh, they started to mock Abdullah bin Mas'ud. That you know, you know this is the, the Muslim, he's supposed to represent Islam. Then look at this weak and feeble individual, what is he ever going to do? Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took an oath. He says, by Allah, these you know, legs that you're mocking and making fun of, they'll be heavier on the scales than a mountain on the Day of Judgment. They'll be heavier on the scales than a mountain on the Day of Judgment. So this hadith alludes to the fact that maybe it's the individual that will be weighed. Maybe it's an individual that will be weighed. So now, the discussion arises, how do you reconcile between all of these narrations? And this, is, has, this has been a theological debate from the past. That, you know, what is it that will be you know, weighed and will be judged on the Day of Judgment? Now, there's a general principle that we'll introduce today, which is الجمع أولى من التارجيح, Which means that if you can reconcile between texts and come to a common ground between texts, that is preferred than to give preference of one opinion over the other. Meaning that if you can reconcile between opinions and bring all of the opinions together to have some weight in the truth, that is preferable in Islam than to say that one opinion is preferred over the other. So if you go back to our example that we began with from Surah Al-Adiyat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, you know, who will be a witness on that day? The who, is it referring to Allah or is it referring to the human beings? So the scholars of Tafsir held both of these opinions. And we reconciled it by saying that, you know, there's no contradiction in both Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mankind being a witness against himself. Similarly, over here, one of the scholars, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah, he comments on this verse by saying, and there's no contradiction that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses all three of these, meaning that some people, they will be weighed themselves because they are a manifestation of the actions that they did. Likewise, for some individuals, it will be scrolls that will be there. Meaning that in order to show the great amount of sin that they committed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings it out on scrolls. Because, you know, it's such a great amount of sin. And another individual, it will be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings their good deeds and bad deeds in front of them. So he mentions that in such a situation, there's no harm in reconciling between all these opinions and saying that all of them will possibly take place. And then the ultimate truth and reality is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now the lessons that are being derived from this verse. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to reflect on the signs. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you signs in this dunya that are going to further take place in the hereafter. So the concept of an earthquake, it is a reminder of the earthquake on the day of judgment. Similarly, when we have an eclipse, that eclipse is a reminder of the major eclipse on the day of judgment. All of these are signs to turn back and to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to recognize Him as a Rabb and as an Ilah. Meaning a Rabb as in our sustainer and creator and as an Ilah, the one that we worship alone. 
Number two is that one of the major events of the Day of Judgment is this shaking of the ground where people will be thrown out of the ground and they will wake up as if they are in a state of intoxication but they will not be in that case. They will be overwhelmed. Number three, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the things that will testify against one another. So previously we took the hands and limbs to testify against you. In this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how even the ground and the earth that right now does not talk, even that will testify against you. Now I just want to go on a small tangent over here. A person, you know, may ask, particularly when it comes to the concept of, you know, deeds being weighed, and this is our point number four, that our deeds will be weighed and, you know, they will be made apparent to us. How will, you know, the deeds be given any weight? You know, the statement of, uh, you know, SubhanAllah wa bihamdihi, SubhanAllah al azim How do you weigh a statement? How does that actually hold any weight? Now, the scholars of the past, they emphasize this concept time and time again. That when it comes to matters of the unseen, when it comes to matters of faith, your intellect can only go so far. And subhanAllah, I bring this up, because today there was a very, very good article that was written by, or actually it was released by Shaykh Abu Isa Ni'matullah. So those of you who are on his Facebook page, you can look at it from his Facebook page. Those of you who are not on Facebook, go to the website firstethical.com. Firstethical.com. And he talks about the statement of Imam al-Dhahabi rahimahullah, where he says that an individual that has a great amount of intelligence, but his intelligence leads him to disbelief, is of absolutely no use. Whereas an individual may not have a great amount of intelligence, but he has taqwa that is greater in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than this great amount of intelligence. Now the reason why I mention that is because mankind, human beings, they become deluded. That once a person attains you know, a certain level of intelligence, he starts to become deluded, he starts to become arrogant, he starts to become, you know, to make an authority out of himself. I mean that just because I don't understand something from the Qur'an or something from the Sunnah, then it must be wrong or it must not make sense. But in reality, this should never be the case. Just because you do not understand something, it does not mean it that it's not true. It just means that there's a you know, a fallacy in your understanding. There's a shortcoming in your understanding. Because the second you start to believe in a God, the second you start to believe in a God, and you recognize that He sent down this revelation, and He is the one who created you as well, then that necessitates that there will never be a contradiction between the sound intellect and revelation itself. Because they both come from the same source. So either there's a deficiency in God and that is not possible, or there's a deficiency in your intellect and that is what we claim. So when the time comes when you don't understand something, the very first thing you need to understand is that the very word Islam, it means submission. That you submit to those things that are beyond the seen. That you believe in the unseen. You submit to those things that may not make sense to you, but you put your faith in it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it. So now the question of, you know, how will these deeds be weighed? How will they be given a weight? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a greater example. That on the day that once you know, judgment is done, the inhabitants of paradise are in paradise, the inhabitants of hellfire are in the hellfire, both of these parties are called. And they will be called, oh inhabitants of the paradise, oh inhabitants of the hellfire, are you where you are meant to be? And they will testify, yes. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring death. Now how do you bring death to a physical form? Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings death to a physical form in the form of a sheep. And that sheep will be killed and then it will be announced that you are in your destinations or in your abodes forever at that time. That the inhabitants of paradise are forever in paradise and the inhabitants of the hellfire are forever at that time in the hellfire. So now, that being said, that is what, you know, we need one, the fourth lesson we need to derive from this. That the deeds being weighed, you may not comprehend it, you may not understand it, but submit to it and derive the lesson we're trying to derive from it. That fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the best of your ability and realize that never belittle any good deed because you think, you know what, it's so trivial that who cares if I do this good deed or not. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَلَا تَحْكِرَنَّ مِنَ الْمَعْرُوفِ شَيْعَةِ That don't belittle any good deed. And at the same time, don't belittle any sin as well. That don't think that, you know what, it's only a minor sin. When I pray, Allah will forgive me for that sin. When I make wudu, I'll be forgiven for the sin. When I go for Hajj and Umrah, I'll be forgiven for that sin. No, that's not the case. You notice what Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, he says that when it comes to sin, the believer 
He looks at the sin as if it is a mountain upon his shoulders. That's very, very weighty. He's waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hold him account for it. And he doesn't know if he will be forgiven. Whereas it is the hypocrite that, you know, treats his sin as if it is a fly on his nose. He thinks if he waves it away, that it's going to disappear. But in reality, that is not the case. And we'll conclude with that. Bi Allah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We'll take three questions. Bi Allah ta'ala. Go ahead, Akhi, our brother in the back. When, uh, when we resurrected the uh, judgment day, uh, like, uh, what's our body or our, uh, what stage of our life is it that we get resurrected? When we're young, when we're old? Like, you know, like, Excellent question. At the last point when we die. Excellent question, very good question. The brother's question, just to repeat it, is that when a person is resurrected on the Day of Judgment, what state are they resurrected in? You know, when they died, when in the early infancy stages, what state are they resurrected in? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best the ultimate reality of what state we are resurrected in. What we do know is the age of the people of paradise, the age of the people in paradise. So if one can assume that it, you know, one, en one enters paradise in the same form as he is judged in, then they mention that he's in his 30s at that time. He's in his 30s when he enters paradise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Question two. Okay, I have a question uh, about Azam al -Kabr. So I'm just wondering at, at some places in the Quran you may read it when they will be resurrected and they say, oh, we were just slept half a day or a portion of a day right. and who waked up, waked us up. So it appears that there is no Azab al well, I'm just a little confused because Azab al is not mentioned in the Quran but it's mentioned in the Hadith. Right. So how does one understand things like that when he says, I walk up on the resurrection, who walked who walk me up? I maybe slept for like half a day or something. Like right, that. excellent. Yeah. So now, in terms of the issue of Adab al Qabr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't directly refer to it in the Quran, but through the books of Tafsir, it is indirectly referred to. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about punishment taking place before punishment, or them being punished twice. Yeah. The first type of punishment that Allah refers to is the punishment in the grave, and then the second type of punishment is the punishment in the hereafter. So even though explicitly the concept of Adab al-Qabr isn't mentioned, then uh, implicitly it is mentioned. Number two Can is... Can you any reference to the Quran? Um, something like that that alludes to this, like there's two azans or something like this. Ayub, can you help me out? <laughs> You remember a verse number though? Surah uh, Al-Ghafir. Khalas, we'll get it for you after, inshallah. Uh, I'll have to look that up. But uh, there's quite a few places. Actually, when even when you took Surah to Takathur, do we not discuss that? No, it doesn't mention that in Surah Takathur. Yeah, but we'll get that for you, B'nai Ta'ala. Now, in terms of this concept of um, the, the second part of your question, where, you know, the who, why will it be, seem so short for some individuals? This is a good question to ask in terms of when does an individual feel that time is very short? I'm asking you this question. At what stage in your life do you feel that time is very short? Old age. <laughs> Old age? No, that's not what I'm referring to. When you're having a good and pleasant time. So you notice that when you're having a good time, time seems to pass by very quickly. So those verses that talk about that, you know, we were only in the grave for a short amount of time, this is referring to those individuals that their graves were actually blessed. That they had a window to paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed some of those blessings. So that when the day of judgment begins, that time passes by so quickly, they f literally it feels like it was only half of a day or part of a day. And that can be also understood from the people of the cave because they slept there for yeah, many yeah. centuries. But when they woke up, they said the same things. Yeah. They said, uh, I mean, that's a different case scenario. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them as a sign. You know, that's not the general case scenario that someone will fall asleep for 300 years, right? That's not the general case scenario. They still said that we also slept for... Excellent. But, but the point I'm trying to say is that there's a concept of enjoyment and there's a, time, there's a concept of Allah creating it as a sign. Whereas the Ashab al-Kahf, they were created as a sign and they weren't necessarily you know, enjoying the, their sleep at that time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The third and last question. Yeah. We have six questions, Allahu Akbar. Actually, we're going to go with Ibrahim. We're going to go with Ibrahim. Everyone else will answer your questions after Salah, inshaAllah. Um, if you go to hellfire, are you just going to keep on burning and burning in the fire? Or are you going to walk on some land too? Are you going to walk on some land too? We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never puts us in that situation. Um, in that situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause people to die in the hellfire and they'll be resurrected 
and punished again, and they will die, and they'll be resurrected. And this will continue happening until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to stop. So in terms of, is it just fire? No, it's not just fire. There's more than fire. There will be, you know, rivers of like blood and rivers of like boiling liquid and stuff. I don't want you to have nightmares tonight, so I'm not going to give you too many details. But yeah, there's more than just boiling fire. May Allah protect all of us. We'll conclude with that, bi'ilahi ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. We'll see you guys next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.